Okay, so um, I'm Kate Stewart, and I'm focusing here at the Linux Foundation on what we can do to make sure that uh, embedded systems um, can become dependable. In particular, uh, the safety critical context, and would like to talk a little bit about that and some of the implications around S bombs and what we're going on with Zephyr. So, with that, oops, hello, there we go. Just want to make sure everyone understands what a safety critical system is. And this is straight from Wikipedia, so you can all check it out. Um, basically, a safety critical system is um, a system which has, if there's a failure or malfunction, and one of the more, one of the more may result in death, severe damage uh, to equipment property or environmental harm. That's straight out of the definition. And obviously, this is something we don't want to see our software doing. So figuring out what we need to do from a system level, as opposed to a project level, is going to be key here. And this is sort of where we're sort of working our way towards. Oops, there we go. So the first thing is you actually need to actually inventory your system. You can't do system analysis unless you know exactly what's in there. And um, today, it's not always clear that people know what software is running um, in the application as well as the operating system and firmware space sometimes because people have you know, pulled things from various places and assembled them. But we also, now it is a pretty standard practice to have a hardware bomb um, and we don't, you know, there's usually a chip number or a chip ID. <laughs> and then when you start getting into it, there's a version, but that usually gets included in the bomb. But I think what we're going to need for safety critical is we need to have that full system um, beyond pretty much all the way from the application and traceability all the way down to the hardware. And this is where I'm really excited about working potentially with the risk of the risk five um, people working on systems there if they're interested in creating this. So part of the reason I'm doing this today is to see if there's someone who's interested in working on a proof of concept with us. So XKCD is the source of a lot of truth out there. And this comic came out last week, uh, last year and most modern digital infrastructure is um, uh, rather complex, but there's pieces out there that people don't know they have a dependency on. Uh, in the embedded space, we are a bit more fortunate and we have better traceability all the way down, but um, there is still, oops, well, there's a camera back on, sorry. There's still an, abs you know, an absence of the information we may want to see. So one of the initiatives that's been happening is trying to define what a software bill of materials is. There's a lot of, um, people who've been working on it and the term has been floating around, but there was no real consensus on what the definition is. And over this last year, NTIA, uh, actually last three years, truthfully, NTIA has been trying to build up a consensus on what this is. And then as part of the recent executive order um, last, um, last week, NTIA ended up releasing its definition of what the minimum elements of a software bill of material are. And so these components can be libraries or modules um, you know, they can be open source, proprietary, free paid. There's no restriction on there. They can be done at the file levels. What we need to know though, is there's certain elements that you want to have available and you want to have the relationship between these elements so you can track down that dependencies trees. So now over to Zephyr <laughs> and they do tie together. Um, Zephyr is an open source RTOS and um, it's basically started five years ago with the view that we wanted to be able to go after safety certification and have a secure RTOS. And so it is cross architectural and there's a risk five and a risk 32 bit, port, uh, sorry, risk five, 64 and 32 bit ports available in this Zephyr repo. It's neutral governance, no one company controls it. Um, anyone's free to contribute, it's permissively licensed and it's very modular and flexible. So you can only have to compile in what you need for an application which makes it very suitable for embedded devices. Um, and we are working towards going after safety certification with it. And so we'll hopefully be one of the few open source projects that's not under commercial sway that's actually open source uh, that has gone through some of the safety certifications. So this is what we're doing with it. Now, as I say, uh, we have the risk five um, support sitting there. And actually there's over 250 boards in the repo and there's over 10 risk five boards. I'd love to see more risk five boards being added, please. Um, so if there's some ports you guys want to have going in there, um, you know, please put in the pull requests. Uh, we're working on our 2.7 release right now. And um, that will be our next LTS. And that will be the starting point for our safety certification as well. So just to give you context, Zephyr is more than just a kernel. It's actually a full system. 
Um, it's using things like kconfig, um, like the Unix kernel uses, although it is not Linux. It's also um, using the device tree. So having these devices, having things plug and play, interoperable, um, it's fairly familiar um, to people. And we have, a, as you can see, a rather good communication stack already integrated as well as various basic services. Now, one of the challenges of open source and safety certification is the fact that you have uh, different pace of uh, development happening up at your tip, like the Linux kernel does. And then you want to potentially sort of have something you can base products off of that isn't changing as much. And so this is what we came with the long-term stable uh, or support version. And from that, we're doing those every two years. And then from this one that's coming up this fall, we'll be taking and going through the certification. So we're working on transforming some of the code base right now. So we're priming up for that. But one of the key things here is we are going to be going after uh, 61508 cell three. Um, that's the path we're planning to aim towards. Um, and we have work ongoing with our coding guidelines that have been established and we're working on doing some code based conversions to them to line up with the MISRA guidance that we've chosen as well as some of the other things. And we're doing work internally in the code repos and trying to share best practices with other projects, other open source projects for traceability and compliance and requirements government. And the project is actually um, contracted to a functional safety manager and we are working with her on uh, pulling together the artifacts and we'll be engaging a certification authority um, towards the end of the year, early next year. And this is gonna be letting us actually do the full traceability on the V model. And uh, community, like I say, we start right from the start with the view that we wanted to go after safety. So this is what we're sort of looking at. And um, most of the information is all on Git, so it is available and visible. And if you're curious about more, I'm happy to put you in touch with Amber, who is our um, safety architect for the project. Now, our initial certification scope is restricted um, for safety in the sense that we're just going after uh, these highlighted blue components initially. And then as, um, so we're basically building up the requirement set from this set and building it up from there. And we'll be looking initially at the 2x86 and ARM. And if there's people that are really strongly interested in risk five, that may be a dimension to start exploring. Um, as you can see, we've got our timeline for this next LTS version coming out. And we'll be starting to work with our certification authority as well as building together the um, compliance and the various safety artifacts that are being called for as part of the collateral. So we have a pretty sweet set of these things, but one of the things that's obviously gonna be needed is um, making sure that we stay secure too, because a lot of safety hazards um, can emerge from security considerations. And so we need to keep ourselves secure and know exactly what is there as we go through the 61508 certifications. So um, the so this goes, takes us back to software build materials. So uh, there's been, uh, software build materials have been in a variety of guidances, um, ANISA, um, basically had the guidelines for securing the IoT things. And then US Congress had the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, both mentioned SBOM in passing as part of something that is a best practice to go after. And then um, in May, we had the um, executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. And in this document, there was 14 mentions of SBOM. And so, um, there was also, uh, NTI was tasked with publishing the guidance as to what really is an SBOM. Uh, neither of the other two really went into that too much detail. So this was part of trying to actually say, okay, what really is this? And this is the start of what we can try to all build off of for automation and so forth. And so, you know, the security team is very active in Zephyr. It's been active since the start of the project. Um, we're a CNA, I'm working with the PCERT team. And you know we've been following best practices, and we're one of the, I guess there's about 3,800 best practices um, badging. People have registered in the CI best practices badge. There's only seven that are gold. Zephyr's one of them, and we're doing a lot of work trying to do the auto, leveraging automation to prevent regressions and you know checking for bounds and some of the other best practices. Um, we've also formed a partnership with Misra. Oh, sorry, with um, Parasoft to work on our Misra scanning and help with the code compliance and vulnerability detections too. And we, the PCERT is there, it's available, it's ready to respond, including when things are not affected. Like for instance, we were not affected by, um, you know, FNET, the current release of FNET didn't, um, from Nisha 33 that came out last year. Uh, we were not 
um, impacted on the 2.4 release, but there was some things down at um, the overall, the prior version, but we had to go down to the um, file level to verify this. So having a software bill of materials down to the file level for embedded is pretty much key for any type of automation and being able to detect what's going on. Right now, most software bill of materials just talk about things at the component level and it's mostly at the system, which is good. It's better than nothing, but um, understanding what the sources are and where we need to go is going to be key. And then quite frankly, being able to update and improve the vulnerabilities and the tracking and automate all this so that it is queryable when you need to query it and you're not having to track a lot is one of the things that was being focused on. And having this feeling for, um, you know, having this understanding of what the security issues are, is gonna be key here because otherwise we're not going to be able to um, make sure the systems are safe. And so when that executive order came out with the best practices that they wanted to see, um, one of the things that was kind of fun for me to do was actually go through it line by line and realize that, hey, we're almost, we're there uh, with Zephyr. So, um, you know, we've been under Git version control since the start. We've got the full traceability. Um, you know, the project is doing weekly scanning. Um, issues are tracked and addressed. We're doing additional checks and so forth, which is being called for. Um, and then it's sort of amusing me in terms of some of the open source references, but, um, you know, we're open source. Um, the details of all the third party tools are available to the maintainers. And that can be generated and put into an SBOM at some point in time in the future if the mental illness you know, expands that. But for safety, we're going to need to put some of that stuff in anyhow. So it'll be emerging. And then you know, all the bugs are tracked. And so you have all the bugs being tracked in a central location. And so you can know what's vulnerable, what's not at a point in time, as well as the documentation at a point in time. All of these are key elements for going after safety certification. Um, you know, all of our um, commits into the repo are signed off by, and we're following the DCO just like Linux kernel is. And there's various conformance checks before their things are merged. So again, best practices are being followed, they're being asked for. And then one of the things that's gonna be an interesting thing for a couple of projects to deal with is um, a software bill of materials. This is called asking explicitly for a software bill of materials, which we're gonna need for safety anyhow. And um, one of the things that's happened is we've been doing it at the source level, and with the two, since the 2.5 release. But as part of the 2.6 release, uh, one of the new features that got added was the ability on the build to generate a software bill of materials for these C files that make up Zephyr. So you can generate your software bill of materials for exactly the files you need uh, that have made it into your binary image based on your configs. And that will let you um, work with it from a fairly effective way to understand, okay, Yes, I have this file here, so I don't. I know I don't have it in the user 33 or I'm not using this compiler set. So you can be more accurate about your vulnerabilities as well as, you know, um, having a full um, picture of the system software level because it's a compiler image. So it's, you know, the, the applications as well as the kernel any firmware, you can put this all into the build and have this generated now automatically for you from Zephyr. So, um, you know, the other thing was, okay, the Zephyr's been a CNA directly. This is an open source project that's listed with a bunch of companies. There's a few other open source projects that are there and they're directly, but we're managing our own vulnerabilities and we have our disclosure policies and people can register for them for free. So if you've got products and you wanna be notified, there's ways of doing it without being a member to the project. And then um, all our processes are documented and visibly available. And the last one made me laugh in the sense that, you know, ensuring the testing to the extent possible, the integrity and provenance of open source software used. Well, Zephyr is an open source project, so, and we're pretty much following all these practices. So if you're using Zephyr, you've got some of this stuff already built in for you. So this has been, that, like I say, that part was sort of fun for me when I saw that. So I just wanted to have a few more um, final thoughts here. Uh, as you can sort of see, the software supply chain tax aren't going to be going away, we all know that. And then embedded resource constrained devices also become vulnerable over time. So we are gonna to need to figure out how we can adopt the industry best practices in the embedded space, especially for safety critical systems and possibly even extend the best practices um, so that we can have accuracy as well as, you know, including what the, into the SBOMs, the build, what information is being used because that's also being used in the safety critical space. Uh, you need to have your tools, you know, your tools are good. You need to know your system's good. And one of the things that is particularly interesting is especially in light of various other vulnerabilities is having that transparency down to the hardware level um, 
and being able to generate a software bill of materials for some of the open hardware IP blocks and so forth and say, okay, hey, this is all supposed to work together. So one of the things that's got me pretty excited is the fact that with RISC-V and various um, scenarios as well as the open hardware, we can start to actually look at creating prototypes, um, proof of concepts of a full true system bill of materials where we're talking the software, the hardware, um, and you know the IP blocks for us five. So one of the reasons I'm here and excited is to see if there's anyone that's interested in helping to partner with us to actually start to look at generating this proof of concept of what this would look like and then start to influence um, some of the emerging bill of materials standards. And so with that, uh, I think that's hopefully useful information for everyone and happy to answer your questions. Uh, yeah, it looks like Kate, the one question uh, somebody did has have is if the slides will be available. So it, will you be uploading those into uh, Sketch? I will upload those into Sketch after. Yeah. <laughs> like I say, some of this was like pretty last minute, but yes, you've got pretty current information here right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So thank you, Kate, so much. You can watch the Q&A for any other questions. And we are going to move on to our next uh, presenter, 